الشيطان الرجيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم وقال سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عهد الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He said in Quran al-Kareem Min al-mu'minin rijal He said from the believers There are men Sadaqu ma'ahadu Allah alayhi Who have been true To the covenant that they made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And that covenant brothers Is to strive is to work to make this deen supreme to make the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest this is the aqad and the ahad that these men took Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا he says some of them قَضَى نَحْبَهُ أي قضى أجله. Some of them have passed away. They have died. ومنهم من ينتظر. And there are those who are waiting. Those in انتظار. To meet Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Struggling in this path. Struggling in this way. وما بدلوا تبديلا. And in their انتظار for Allah سبحانه وتعالى. While they wait and they struggle. وما بدلوا تبديلا. They never changed. They persevered. But this is the ayah that I remember. When I think of certain shaksiyat, certain personalities. And Shaykh Taqi, Shaykh Taqiuddin and Nabhani, Allah Yarhamuhu, is one of those personalities. But as he was the founder, the muassis of Hizb al-Tahrir. And he actually disliked that we talk about personalities. And that is perhaps why we do not know so much about Shaykh Taqiyuddin. His name is not maybe so well known as it could be if we take his daraja and his makana and his status and his ilim. Because he believed that the message must prevail. He believed the da'wah must prevail. He believed the ideas are what should be given leadership. He believed in intellectual leadership. And that is why the ideas that he talked about, alhamdulillah, we see, these are what have leadership. These are what people know about. So for example, the work to establish khilafah, Sharia, Islam as a way of life, these things have become known and spread. Everyone knows. But not everyone knows the name Shaykh Taqiyuddin al Nabhani. And of all the years that I have been involved in the da'wah, for some 17, 18 years, this is the first time, in fact, I am discussing the Shaykh publicly like this. But inshallah, what we want to do today is to look at the life of Shaykh Taqiyuddin from the perspective as he wanted and as he struggles throughout his life from the perspective of what is the problem of the Ummah from the perspective of what is the Islamic solution from the perspective of what is the vital issue of this Ummah what is the priority and what should this Ummah be concerned about and what should this Ummah work for these are the inspiration, the ideas we want to take and glean from the life of Shaykh Taqiyuddin and Nabhan. Before we talk about his vision, brothers, I want to make some ta'arif, introduction to Shaykh Taqiyuddin and Nabhani. Who is Shaykh Taqiyuddin and Nabhani? Brothers, his nasab is Shaykh, is Muhammad Taqiyuddin. Ibn Ibrahim 
bin Mustafa bin Ismail bin Yusuf an Nabhani. He comes from the Nabhan tribe, whose ascendants, whose roots go back to Tamim al Dari, the Sahabi. And the tribe, they settled in Palestine. Sheikh Taqi himself, he was born in Izjim, which is a district in Haifa, in Palestine, and he was born in 1909. Brothers, he was born in the cradle of knowledge. His family were ulama. So it was in a be an environment of iman and taqwa that Sheikh Taqiyuddin grew up. So for example, his mother Taqiyya, she was an alima. She was a scholar of Islamic disciplines, of uloom. Women would go to her for fatawa because she was the daughter of Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani, and we'll talk about him in a little while. Sheikh Taqi's father was also a alim. He was a faqih. He was a teacher. He was a qadi. Based in Palestine and in Dimash Damascus. Sheikh Taqiyuddin's grandfather. His paternal grandfather, via his father, his father's father, was a faqih, was a sheikh, was a scholar of Arabic language and of usul, an usuli scholar. Sheikh Taqiyuddin's grandfather, from the maternal side, via his mother, <coughs> was the great Abu al-Mahasim, Yusuf al Nabhani. His mother did not write any books, so therefore you don't know a lot about her and her ilm. His father did not write, he taught, he was a qadi, he practiced ilm. His grandfather from his father's side did not write either, but his grandfather from his mother's side did write. Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani, he is well known. Even today, many of the ulama that you see, if you go to Lebanon, Lebanon, you will find that their ijazat, their ijazat and their silsala and their chain, it goes back to Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani. Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani had something like 50 ijazas. He mentioned that actually in his own tarjama. In his book, Hadi al-Murid ila turuq al-Asanid. Book of Hadith. Because his grandfather, Yusuf al-Nabhani, was a scholar and mutakhassis and specialist in ilm al-Hadith. He wrote 60 more than scholarly works, Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani, more than 60, out of which 48 have been published. Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani, he was a poet, he was an usuli, he was an expert in hadith, and not only that, he was a qadi based in Palestine. And then he was moved, posted to Istanbul, which at the time of the Khilafah, the Osmani Khilafah, and then posted in Mosul, in Iraq. So he was a Qadi as well. See, his family was a family of ulama and Quda, Qadis. His grandfather was connected with the political circles in the Uthmani Khilafah. 
were heavily involved in the affairs of the state at the time. And it was in this environment, brothers, that Sheikh Taqiyuddin al Nabahani he grew up. In a ma'dan, in the cradle, in the mine of knowledge and iman. And he had examples set for him. Sheikh Yusuf al Nabahani, when Palestine, after the First World War, came under British rule, he was offered the post of Mufti of Palestine. But he declined because of the British control and he feared that he would not be able to judge and pass his fatawa according to Kitab and Sunnah. This is the example that his grandfather set him. His grandfather was well known for debating the modernists of the time and writing long refutations against them like Jamaluddin Afghani and Muhammad Abdu. So Shaykh Taqi, he grew up in this environment. In terms of his own learning brothers, he used to attend the halaqat of his grandfather, who when in the summer he used to come to Palestine because he was posted in various places in the Uthmani Khilafah. When he would come in the summer, and he would give his halaqat, ulama would come and attend and listen to Yusuf al Nabahani. And Sheikh Taqiyuddin will also attend and learn from his grandfather. Brother Sheikh Taqiyuddin, he finished memorizing the Quran at the age of 10. He studied under his mother first, and then he studied under his father who taught him the ulum al-deen, the disciplines, the Islamic disciplines. <coughs> By the age of 10 brothers, not only he man finished memorizing Quran, he was composing poetry. He was reading the books of fiqh. This is Shaykh Taqiyuddin and Nabhani in terms of his learning. His grandfather, Yusuf al Nabhani was impressed by his grandson so much, he felt that he has potential. So what he did at the age of 16, when Shaykh Taqi was 16, he sent him to Azhar with five gold Ottoman liras to pay for his studies. And he, in 1928, he entered Azhar and Darul Ulum, and he began his studies in Azhar under the instruction and under the guidance of ulama like Sheikh Khidr al Hussein, who then be became the Sheikh al Azhar. And that was under the instruction of his own grandfather. That when he sent his grandson, he instructed that you will study under this Sheikh, the top Sheikh in, Az in Azhar. Brothers, by 1932, Sheikh Taqiyuddin al Nabhani, he finished his studies. He came out, he graduated with top grades, obtaining the Alimiya degree with top grades, to the extent that when he came to Palestine, in Palestine, you know, there was a newspaper, front page, it said, Hani An. Congratulations to Palestine for Sheikh Taqiyuddin al Nabhani. So, just like his grandfather, who was one of the ulama of Palestine, Sheikh Taqiyuddin al Nabhani was also one of the ulama of Palestine. Brothers, that is his learning. In terms of his political thinking and his thinking about the Ummah's problems, you have to understand, appreciate the climate he was in. Brother, 1928 when he went to Azhar, 
1924, the Khilafah had been destroyed. And in Cairo, you can see what the discussion was. What were the debates and the discussions that people were undertaking and engaging in at that time? The ulama, the mufakkireen and the thinkers that the Khilafah had been destroyed. What do we do? What is the solution of the Ummah? What is the way forward? How do we deal with the West? These are the debates that people were having. And Sheikh Taqi, when he was in Cairo, he participated in this debate. It's well known that he used to attend these munakashat and these debates. And he would give his view. So from an early age, since his grandfather, who was involved in the affairs of life, he himself, he began to think about what is the problem? Why are we in this situation? Why has the Khilafah been destroyed? Because at that time, the Muslim land was under the occupation of the British and the French who carved up the Osmani Khilafah and they divided various parts in the Sykes-Pico agreement, the secret agreement that the, that the British and the French they had before, just before the First World War, that how they're going to carve the Muslim countries. The French are going to get a certain part, the British are going to get Palestine, or what's called the British Mandate. This is the situation. The lands were, our lands were occupied. The Khilaf were destroyed. So this is the situation in which the Sheikh Taqi, he was discussing and debating with the people. And there were true strands of thinking there. There were, the, there were the people who were Islamic, from an Islamic persuasion, who wanted to revive, and there were those who were smitten by the West, who wanted secular solutions. And this was the debate that was raging at the time. And this, you can see how his thinking was widening, and his thinking about these issues. What can we do? Despite his participation in all these debates, Shafaqi at that point, he never joined any groups, any of the organizations at that time. In 1933, brothers, when Shafaqi, he came back to Palestine, he took up a post as teacher, teaching Ulumuddin, Islamic sciences in Haifa. After a while, he realized that because of the occupation, that the education system were being tampered with by the colonialists, and he could not teach the Islamic sciences as it should be taught. And so he left the teaching profession, and then he joined the judiciary, because he felt, because at that time, even though Palestine was under you know, British control, British mandate. It, there was, the qada, the judiciary was still able to judge according to Sharia. And so he took up a position in, in Ramallah. He was also judge in Jenin. And Finally, until 1952, he was the judge in the appeals court in Al Quds in Jerusalem. So that's brother his brother's his, his career or his background. But during all of this, he felt that something needed to be done. What is the solution? He saw various solution people be proposing. One hand he saw Abdullah al Azam Qassam brother who was fighting the British. So there were people who were fight, who felt that the problem was colonization. That the Muslim land had been colonized so the solution is to fight. And in fact he himself supported the effort at that time to liberate 
those lands from the British colonial rule. He also saw people who felt that the problem was a moral ethical problem. So what they were doing was that they would give khutbah and speeches and they were talking about you know, how individually a person can rectify himself. He can increase his iman, he should increase his manduba, just individual development. He saw that as another, you know, strand of thinking or work that was taking place. And that was in Palestine. Because the Ikhwan Muslimin at that time, they were active. And so he, so he saw this line of work that people were engaged in. He saw others were participating in the elections or participating in the government. i.e. they were working according to the system and part of the system in order to bring about change. So Shaykh Taqiyuddin, he saw these various approaches at the time and also he saw those who were completely lost, those who wanted to follow the West blindly. These were the various approaches at that time. And he began to think about this issue. He contacted others, ulama in Palestine, people like Dawood Hamdan, Sheikh Ahmed al Da'ud, Sheikh Abdul Qadim Zalloum from Al Khalil, Ghanim Abdu, Nimr al Masri, and others and to discuss that what is the solution of the Ummah. Because by that time, Shaykh Taqi, he started to develop in his mind that we cannot have these partial solutions. These partial solutions are not going to solve our problem. In 1948, when the Muslims lost Palestine and the Israelis, they declared their state in Palestine. Sheikh Taqi, he left, and then when he came back, he wrote a letter to the rulers of the time called Risalat al Arab. And he wrote another book called Inqaz of Philistine. These are his early writings where you can see the thinking that Muslims, the Muslims can only revive on the basis of Islam. At that point he wrote that the Arabs, they can only revive if they go back to their own culture. Not Arab nationalism, but Islam. When they go back to that, then they can revive. And when they follow Islam as a complete system, then they can revive and take themselves out of the situation. Brothers, after writing this, the rulers, as you know, did not respond. Nothing. And he decided after that, that he wanted to establish a party, a movement, which will engage in the work to re-establish the Khilafah. Because, brothers, when he looked at the problem, he realized that none of this is the solution. So, for example, the occupation, the problem wasn't just colonization. Because people were gaining, countries were gaining independence. But then what were they doing? After gaining independence, the ruler who was mesmerized by the Western culture was doing, was being controlled, remote controlled by the Western powers. The systems and the rules that were being implemented were the same. So really, we had not physical colonization, we had intellectual colonization. So just fighting is not going to solve the problem of this Ummah. Because what tended to happen is after independence, the Muslims started to fight amongst themselves. Because there was no clear vision of what is the solution, what is the alternative, once 
the invader has gone. He saw people were talking about Salah and the Mandubat. Although these things are a fundamental part of the deen, but they have their place. People were saying that this is the solution. When at a time, subhanAllah, we were under occupation. At a time when kufr rule, when the sharia had been suspended, that people were saying that we need to individually rectify. And he realized that this is not the solution. Because this is abdication and a dereliction of our responsibility. This is us resigning from the reality and opening the saha, the opening the field for the kuffar and its agents, while we go in the hilltops to perfect ourselves. That this actually will not solve the problem. He realized that those who wanted to work part of the system, that this will not actually bring change. Because this actually is a game that the regimes play to contain those who want to bring Islamic change. Because by bringing you in and giving you some morsels or some hope and bringing Islamic parties in into parliament and into the regime, what they do is actually allow their own continuation and allow the prolongment of their own regime and sustain the status quo. Why? Because the system and the regime is set in such a way that it will not allow you to remove it. It will allow you to play the game for a while and give people false hope that we are going to bring some change, Islamization they call it, some rules. And you will spend a hundred years for one rule and not get it, even then. And what Shaykh Taqiyuddin he did so at that time, we saw born out later by those who part in Turkey, who participated in the system. They ended up, brothers, doing what, doing what they were criticizing the government of doing. So for example, in Turkey, the Muslim or the Islamic party that went to power, they were the ones who were signing treaties with Israel. They were the ones who were engaging in military joint maneuvers. They are the ones who ended up actually imprisoning those who were calling for Khilafah in the end. Why? Because they want to maintain their small portfolio. And they struggled to bring one rule, hijab. But even then they failed. Shaitaki also realized that those who were smitten by the Western culture, that this is not a solution. Subhanallah, how can the disease be a solution? How can it be a cure? It is the Western culture which is the cause of the downfall of this ummah. It is the colonization of our minds. It is the removal of our way of life and the installment and the forced implementation of kufr in our life, in our land, which has caused the division and the problems. How then can we refer to that as the cure, when it is the disease? That's why Brother Shaykh Taqi, he came to the conclusion, what we need is not a halun tarqi'i, not a partial solution. We need a halun jadri, what he called in his book, Takatul al Hizbi, he said, We need a hal jadri. We need a radical solution, a fundamental solution to this problem. The only way we can begin the point of recovery is when we radically change. Because the problem, brothers, is not, the, not just the rulers, just not just the occupation. It was the ummah itself who had declined. The Ummah had declined in her thoughts. The society had declined in its thoughts, in its emotions and its systems. In our thinking, we have adopted Western ideas. So when we think of solutions or 
government and policy, we look to the West. And those who are Islamic, they justify it with some text. Our feelings and our emotions, affected by Western culture, our system and our structures of ruling in our countries, not Islamic, whether we're talking about monarchies or the Ba'athi regime or well, the so-called democracies, none of which are according to the Islamic model or the Islamic example. So he realized that actually to change this, we needed to have a fundamental change. Partial solution, engaging in the system will not change because we will get sucked up into that system and we will be doing that forever. Just attending to the individual nafs and development will not solve the problem. Although the individual nafs that is part and parcel of the work. But that cannot be the only work. To do that would be to neglect the kufr rule and the conspiracies and everything that else that is happening in society. And actually it's a direct election of our duty. So none of these solutions, brothers, he realized would not work. What was required was a movement, a party, we should be an intellectual party. We should work within society to change those, the emotions and the thought. And we will work for that radical solution to change the system and to replace it with the Khilafah al Rashida. This, brothers, was the vision of Shaykh Taqiyuddin al Nabhani that we need to change the existing status quo and that the problem was ideological that the Western ideology had occupied our minds. So therefore what we need to do, we need to liberate our minds from the Western culture. That is why the call had to be intellectual. Violence is not going to liberate our mind from the Western culture. The problem wasn't just intellectual, the problem was political. Because the rulers that were imposed by the West and who were mesmerized by the Western culture, as long as they are in power, as long as these systems which they implement are in place, nothing will change. No matter how much we engage in elections, no matter how many speeches we give, no matter how many talks we give, until and unless the thoughts and ideas of society are changed and the system is changed and it is replaced with an Islamic system, change will not happen. Brothers, Shaykh Taqi was the first one to talk about Islam as a system. In fact, one of his early works is called Nidham al-Islam. The system of Islam. You see, people were seeing Islam as Salah. You see, Islam is just a set of rituals. Some people saw Islam is just a spiritual development, way to spiritually ascend, and that was it. And those who wanted to see Islam politically were actually Isla Islamizing Western models. So they were justifying democracy from Islam. They were justifying nationalism from Islam. So Islam as a system at that time, brothers, was not appreciated. Islam was seen in this way. And those who wanted some kind of radical change, who wanted an Islamic political change, were vague. What is this Islamic system that you want? We'll tell you when we get there. That was the response. That was the thinking. As Umar ibn Khattab he used to say, Tafakku qabla an tasudu, wa in suttum la waqta li tafakku. So gain fiqh, knowledge of the deen, before you gain power and leadership. Because once you gain power and leadership, there is no time to gain fiqh and knowledge. So, brothers, with that in mind, Shaykh Taqi, he contacted the other ulama in Palestine. 
and through 1951, 52, and 53, he started to put, they started to put things into place. Preparation, the stafakko that we talk about before publicly announcing the establishment of Hizb Tahrir. What did they do? They worked out, brothers, what is the sensation of the problem in the Ummah? What is the radical solution, which is the re-establishment of the Khilafah, the unification of the Ummah, the revival of the Ummah according to the Islamic thoughts and the ideas? To do that, you needed a culture. You needed preparation. Because to have goals such as this, lofty goals, without actual preparation and knowing what is the Islamic system, what, is, what are the Islamic thoughts and ideas, what is wrong with the Western culture? Because at that time, people were mesmerized by the Western culture and they lost the confidence and the thicker in the Islamic thoughts and ideas. So how do we get back that confidence in the Islamic thoughts and ideas? How do we refute the Western ideas? What is this alternative that we're going to bring? What are its details? They began to work on that. And once they were ready, they sent a letter to the Minister of Internal Affairs at that time in 1953, on the 2nd of March 1953, to inform them, not to get permission, because that was based on the own old Ottoman law, which said that any group can establish itself as long as they're just informed. It wasn't permission, it was just to inform that look we set up. So Shaykh Taqi, what he did with Dawud Hamdan and others, he sent a letter informing the authorities of the establishment of Hizb al-Tahrir. What happened the day after the Hizb was banned? Because they realized what this work and this effort is going to be about. They realized the rulers at the time were shaking. They knew that this, is, this work is going to change, is bringing about toppling of these regimes. A change where they will lose their power. And so they immediately banned the party. And the party began to issue books just to show you the preparation and the thinking and the crystallization of the solution. <coughs> For example, the early, one of the early books of, the, of Hizb al-Tahrir, The System of Islam. In this book, for the first time, in a clear manner, it talked about Islam as a system. Not as a set of rituals, but Islam as a system, as a way of life, as an ideology, providing solutions to life's problems. Because the Hizb realized, Shaykh Taqi realized the problem was people had lost confidence in the Islamic solutions. Either because they did not see Islam having solutions, so they went to the West for solutions, or the solutions that Islam had, they could not appreciate how these will practically manifest and solve our problems. Because these were seen as just ahkam, not as solutions. And so in Nidam al-Islam, he outlined this point, how Islam is a way of life. Islam is a Nidam, a system. It's an ideology. It's a way of life, a system that is to be implemented in society. And he talked about capitalism and communism. You might not make much of you know, communism now, but at that time, communism was a big thing, especially in the Soviet you know, in, during the Cold War. So he wrote refutations of capitalism, how to understand the capitalist ideology and refute it, how to understand the fallacy of the communist ideology and refute it, and how books the outlining and detailing this. In 1953, as early as that, he issued the ruling system at its inception. Nidawal Hukum fil Islam. What is the ruling system? Because at that time people confused. Is the Islamic system monarchical? 
Because that time Abdullah, you know, in, in, uh, was known first Trans Jordan and then Jordan, who was the leader, you know, who declared himself king. And people giving him bayah. Some people were saying we should be, because this is a post colonial period. Independence has occur, occurred in some of the countries. What do they do? They were saying, well, we need a federal system, a democratic system. We need, you know, a, na a, a, a national socialist system. These are the things that people were discussing. And these are the things we've seen for the last, you know, ever since the Khilafah was destroyed for 100 years. What has happened? Has the Muslim countries revived the systems? So Sheikh Taqi, they issued ruling system to show that the Islamic system is a unitary system. It is the Khilafah system. What are the organs of the state? The judiciary, the Mu'awineen. What are the rules? What is the ways of appointment and dismissal? What is the role of Shura? Because people are confused about Shura, they think it's democracy. That's the level of confusion that was existed at that time. So in that book, and we don't have the time to put Shattaqi and the Hizid outlined what the Islamic system was going to be. And the party issued a constitution which never existed before. What is the constitution of the Islamic State? Because no one had an understanding of how the state is going to run, how this Khilafah is going to run. It was the party first and foremost that wrote, and even till this day, I have not seen any Islamic constitution for an Islamic state, which is as detailed as the one that was written at that time, because it was unheard of. The party issued economic system also in 1953 and its inception. What is the economic system? Because the Muslims were mesmerized by Western models in a Western company structure. In the book, it discussed the gold standard. It discussed the economic solution in detail. And perhaps we have a copy, copies there in the stall you can see. In 1953, brothers, which was unheard of at that time. So detailed outline of what the economic system is going to be. The social system, also published in 1953. You see, in 1953, the party was established. So all of this thinking and preparation had been done. So how are men and women going to interact in society? Because people are confused. Some were saying, well, if we follow the Islamic model, you know, then you know, the half of the population is going to be you know, taken out with this, you know, this hijab. They can't participate in society. This is backward. What we need, women need to come out and mix and free mix. And they started to, you know, espouse Western sort of values in the social system. So Sheikh Taqi, he wrote this book, 1953, to show how men and women can interact in society, how the system allows for that. Also in 1953, the party issued Mafahim Hazd al-Tahrir. In this book, it discussed the concepts now. Yes, we have declined. But in what? What ideas have we declined? What ideas have we taken from the West? So he talked about the khayr and the shar, the husn and the qubah, the good and bad, how the criteria has been confused with the Western idea of utility and benefit, maslaha. Because people talk about maslaha as if it's the same thing at that time. So he began to discuss spirituality. What is spirituality? Ruh, ruhaniya. People are confused. They saw ruhaniya is seclusion from society and making, you know, we make i'tikaf in Ramadan, isn't it? Only for 10 days. They thought Ruhaniya was i'tikaf from life. That's how they understood it. And they refused to engage 
in the challenges and the problems and the troubles of the time from a, to bring the Islamic solution. So Shaykh Taqi, he defined, he said, no. He said, spirituality is masj al madda bil ruh For the first time he clarified what is true spirituality. He said it is masjul madda bil ruh It is the mixing of the matter with spirit. What does that mean? It is the linking of the action with the wahi. Before you do an action, what is the hukum shara'i? In every action that you do. When a person does that, the aqidah now is alive in the person. Because he referred to Quran and Sunnah for all his problems, whether economic, social or political. And of course, in his ibadat. So therefore now this person is spiritual. So he defines spirituality. And also at that time people were confused because they saw the Western culture. What can we take? What can we not take? They were confused. Sayyid Qutub, one of those who engaged in this discussion, he said these are the things we can take, these are the things we cannot take. But he did not put down the principle that you and me can apply and say, well, this is what we can take. He just gave examples of things you can take, examples of things we can't take. The tabalwur crystallization hadn't happened yet. Sheikh Taqi, he talked about the concept of hadara and madaniya. He gave principle. He said, hadara is wujhat mafahim, concept which come from wujhat nadar fil hayat, from the viewpoint of our life. All of these things, he said, this is culture we cannot take. It is from a different ideology. And madaniya is ashkalu maddiya. It is the material form. We don't have time to go into detail today. So he gave principle. So brothers, these are just some of the works. And finally, there's many more which I can't go into now. One other work, political concepts of his tahrir. How do you understand what is happening in the world? What is the struggle at the moment? Because people, they could, did not understand the political reality. And because they did not understand the political reality, they were falling prey and engaging with the kuffar, and engaging with the colonialists, and in the end being used. So he did analysis. It said that Sheikh Taqi would spend hours on the radio. Because in those days, you didn't have you know, the access to information that we have, just radio. His little radio, when, wherever he went. And he would listen to the news, what is happening, what is King Farouk doing, what is, you know, happening in Egypt. So for example, he exposed that Abdul Nasser was an American agent. At a time when everyone thought that Abdul Nasser is the savior of the Ummah. Because he nationalized the Suez and he was making noises against Britain and the former colonial countries. But Sheikh Taqi at that time, he exposed, he said, this is an American agent. Do not pin your hopes on this man. Do not run behind this man. He will leave, he will deceive you. And only recently now, you know, as information is now declassified, we find out the true situation. So for example, Miles Copeland, one of the operative, CIA operative at that time, discussed how the CIA were involved in bringing about Jamal Abdul Nasser. We don't have time for that. But you see, so political concepts, how do you understand what is happening in the reality? So brothers, Sheikh Taqiyuddin, you know, he established the party in 1953 with this vision, with this understanding which no one had at the time, that the problem of the Ummah is not occupation. The problem of the Ummah is not our moral degeneration. The problem of the Ummah is not that we are not spiritual enough. The problem of the Ummah is that we have ideologically declined. We cannot see Islam as a way of life. We do not see Islam as a solution to life's problems. We've lost thicker and our confidence in Islam. Therefore, 
in the minds of the Muslims, this dhikr is to be brought back through da'wah. And the existing systems need to be changed. And only then will be at the point of recovery. If not say the Khilafah is the beginning, you know, we'll solve all the problems and there'll be no problems. No, that is the point of the recovery of the Ummah. And with that, he set about working. Alhamdulillah, in Palestine and the various areas, the party spread, the work spread. Initially, the way they used to do da'wah was, you know, in the colleges, in the schools, they would teach, they even used to teach Nizam al-Islam in, in class. You know, you're going to school, yeah, you're learning Nizam al-Islam in your secondary school. They used to teach. And because we had ulama, khatibs, in the khutbahs, they would uh, give khutbah and they would discuss the ideas which you did not have before. People coming out, talking about Islam as a way of life, talking about the reality and the problems and the analysis, why this is wrong. How? For example, at that time, that do not get distracted by the Yahud. Who is the one who is putting the, facilitating the settlements in Palestine? Because what happened is that the British wanted the focus to be taken from them. And so, you know, they instigated troubles. So the Muslims started to have, you know, skirmishes with the Yehud who were coming at that time. It was long before even 1948. And so the party said, look, the real problem is not actually the Yehud. Real problem are those, the West, the colonial powers who have installed these rulers who facilitate this occupation. So only when these rulers are removed and the Islamic system is brought about, then when radical change will happen. Very quickly, brothers. So what happened is they banned teaching all of the books and they started to clamp down on the Shabab who were teachers at that time, imprisoned them, started torturing them. And in 1954, they passed uh, the law of preaching and guidance, which meant that you could not give a khutbah anymore, you know, without seeking permission from the government. So the party's activities, they tried to curtail the party's activities. But the work continued, it began to spread in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, and the da'wah spread in all of these countries. Shattaki, he traveled so many times, you know, from Lebanon to Syria, if you study his life, to all these places, and he sent people, he sent Sheikh Abdul Qadir Zalloum to Iraq to establish the core of the party there. He sent him to also to Turkey to establish the party there and the work. And the work increased for this. And during the 60s, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, the da'wah spread. And in fact, Jamal al-Banna, a secularist, in his work, he was saying that the core of the party was spreading like wildfire everywhere. Which is when the puppet regimes, under the instruction of their masters in the West, they clamped down on the party and they started to torture the Shabab and the severe torture started to take place such that the security situation was so bad. You know, Sheikh Taqi, he used to go around because he's a sheikh from Azhar. He used to have his turban, he used to have his, uh, his robes and he was going and meeting people. When the situation intensified so badly, the security situation, he found that he could not move freely because he needed to continue meeting other leaders, parties, people of Nusra. In Iraq, when he met the army officers from the Sunni army officers in Iraq, he spent eight hours with them, one session, eight hours. Which he convinced them. He convinced them to, to instigate 
action to change the system. But he felt that more preparation is needed. And so he came back and he sent others to increase the work in Iraq. So that's what he did. He, he took his turban off, he took his robes off, and started wearing normal clothes. Like you and us, you and me, normal clothes. So he can mix with the people. He will not be recognized. And the party, it faced, it is called many tests. And one of the things is still abiding is the fact that the party will not compromise whatever happens. This is something known about Hizb al In fact, in 1953, it talked about the ideological danger in Takatul al Hizbi, one of the works. It said that, that the people, the party will be between two fires. One is that as it is exposing the rulers, obviously it's going to incur the wrath of the rulers. But also, if that ruler is popular, it's going to incur the wrath of the people. And in fact, that's exactly what happened in the time of Jamal Abdul Nasser. Because people were mesmerized by this man, who was talking about unity. Removing the colonialists, doing brave action like, you know, nationalizing the Suez, which was built by the French and the uh, and the British. And at that time, the party came out and said he's an agent. It was easy to compromise at that time. In fact, many Shabab could not take the pressure because it sounded crazy to say something like that at that time against public opinion, against the rulers. Many left at that time, it was a test for the party. But the Sheikh persevered and he continued. And the party also continued and remained true to its ideas and did not compromise because it was easy to change and to remain silent. Because the party had seen and discussed this in Takal al Hizbi, that how many other parties, when they set about with ideals, because they compromised, they ended up complete opposite of how they began. So, for example, in Turkey, they began, we want to bring Islam. But they ended up signing treating, treaties with the Yahud once in government. So the party continued. And the torture and the ta'adib of the shabab, it intensified. And the sheikh who would travel, constantly need to travel because of the security situation. The party brothers, the sheikh, in the end, just to because I want to open up for questions and answers, inshallah. It, in terms of how Sheikh Taqiyuddin, you know, he passed away. It was in 1977 that he passed away. What happened shortly before that, he went to Iraq. And this time in Iraq, he was caught by the Mukhabarat. But you know, he had a different ID on him. Yeah, he, he was not under his name. So they weren't sure who he is. Is this the top man? You know, is this someone else? And so they started to torture him to find out his identity. Who are you? You know, they were beating his head, torturing him. And he kept saying, Ana rajulun ajuz ataytu lil alaj. He said, I am an old man. I have come for ilaj. Brothers, you know, in Arabic, ilaj means two things. Yeah? It means medication, it means solution. You see. So I'm an old man, I've come for ilaj. He's obviously thinking, you know, like uh, for example, Rasulullah was making hijra with Abu Bakr and Quraysh, some of their men caught up with them and they don't know who Rasulullah was. So they asked Abu Bakr, you know, um, who is this man? And Abu Bakr, he said, he's my hadi, he's my guide. Yes, I get lost. 
Obviously what he meant, my heart is going to show me the way to Sirat al-Mustaqim. Not only the way to Medina. <laughs> you see? And so Shaykh Taqi said, Ana ataytu, I've just come for ilaj. And they tortured him. In the end, Alhamdulillah, what happened is that they discarded him on the borders of Lebanon. Because, why I say Alhamdulillah? Because, you know, his ID was Lebanese ID. And they sent it. You know, they contacted the Lebanese authorities. And by the time the Lebanese authorities confirmed that this is fake, they would really let him go. And when the Sheikh Taq, when Sheikh Taqi, he came back to, you know, Lebanon, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Zalloum, he said that he was a figment of what he was before. Because he'd lose so much weight because of the torture. He was exhausted, frayed, weak. Not to mention that some years before, he'd already had a stroke. But the Sheikh, he continued. It did not stop. And then finally, he fell ill. He went in a coma. He was taken to a hospital in, in Lebanon. And his son was there. 